I was coming out of college in 06. So this is 2006, getting a fortune 500 company. You were in suit and ties to, yeah. to work every day. And guys that had kids older than me, totally looking down their noses. They've got their own ways of doing sales. And I listened to everything that they said, and it just always bugged me a little bit because I hated being on the other side. Like yeah. I hate getting sold to like that. Oh my gosh. And yeah. there was this undercurrent for a long time thinking, I want to do what's right for the person. I don't think yes. that we need to learn every objection. I don't think I need That's to right. talk Overcome you into doing something. Overcome objections, preempt them. Yeah. I get that you should be knowledgeable in what you're trying to do in more of a helpful manner, not in a yeah. combative manner to get them to sign a piece of paper, right? The worst objection that I was taught in the early days by some of these, not old school, but maybe old school salespeople. I would say it's still, it's old school. Like it times have changed, sales are different now. They are. And, and that mainly because the buyer's different. But the one that really made my skin crawl was if you're sitting across from a prospect, typically a man, at least in the early days, not now, that's different now, but I was often 90% of the time across from a man, but it could, it would also work with a female at the time. And if you got an objection, I had this one sales guy tell me, you need to like attack, literally attack their ego. I was like, what? And you say, when they say the objection, I need to talk to my wife. And you know, these old school guys would be like, yeah. they would say, attack them and say, oh, do you need your wife to make every decision? You need your wife to help you make decisions, go to the bathroom? Your it's job is terrible. Dude, it's a terrible paradigm. I don't understand <laughs> how that worked in the 80s or the 90s or whatever, but I don't know. It's, and you're right. Like the buyers are different. The times are different. The marketing mediums are different. The, yeah. the availability of consumer information is different, especially in what I do, right? Real estate. Everybody knows what his estimate is. And that's something that they have basic information on. And so yeah. you go through all these sales training and just this undercurrent forever was, first of all, just my personality type is if everybody's doing it, I'm not because that's I right. absolutely hate what everybody's doing. I just want to be against the grain for some reason. I'm just cut from that cloth and in the nicest way possible. I don't care what anyone on this planet thinks of me, yeah. period. Like I just, <laughs> I'm, in the nicest there. I'm not way, there yet. You sound very integrated, but not in a mean way or bitter just in way. a very like, no, I'm comfortable with who I am. I have my thoughts, opinions, and beliefs, and I know that everything that I do is in the best interest of other people. And so I can lay my head down at night knowing that I never felt like I forced anybody to do anything that was against what they wanted. And I don't like pushing products that I don't believe in. Let me catch that real quick because I want to get back on this boiler room sales talk. And for those okay. watching, we were chatting and I hit record because he said something about, we both learned sales in a boiler room, but you said something very intriguing. My desire is that we get to the real human side of what I see as excellence. And I've seen some of your posts and I thought this guy's doing something with excellence and I'm not even sure what he does, but <laughs> I want to talk to him. But this idea that I truly in this, in a kind way, don't care what people think of me. That normally only comes on the other side of crisis. Like few people are born that way. Do you feel you were born that way or have you gone through no. something that got you there? No. And that's a great question. So my story is had a bunch of sales jobs, took risks, started, I, I worked for this startup company in, in downtown Orlando, mm -hmm. 26 year old kid was the CEO. He was a little younger than me. I was a couple of years older than him at the time. Sure. Spoon fed. I found out his parents were politicians. He had a ton of money. He's just playing around anyway. But I had bought in. I worked my butt off. I traveled the entire state of Florida for a phone application that would connect you with security on college campuses. So student security. Interesting. So anyways, the, the main point was I had had all these jobs. I wanted to believe the best in people. And I got to that point and I knew I wasn't risk averse. Like I have a great head on my shoulders. I think we should all take risks yes. because you're not going to gain anything truly great or that's worth it. And the one thing that I live by is if it's easy, it's not worth it. I agree. Like everything that's truly worth it mm -hmm. is hard work and yes. you need to be willing to put in more hard work than anybody else sitting next to you because the gains are great. Like the rewards yes. are great. And it's not just finances. It's what those finances can do for you and your family. Yes. So my crisis situation was during this job, it was Friday, end of day. We worked in this place where other companies like shared space, the total tech to a T. <laughs> so it's dark. Everybody can see it because there's just windows everywhere. These guys over here doing this company, we're doing this company is shared space. Yeah. 
And he pulls me over and he's like, hey, funding's run out from like our second seed funding. I've got to let you go. So that day I had to get in my car. I had to call my pregnant wife oh. the Friday before Christmas. Oh my God, bro. And tell her, then it gives me chills talking about it right now. Like I had to tell her that I had just lost my job and my wife is the most wonderful person that anybody like God could have created for me. Wow. And she said, it's going to be fine. Come home. And in that car ride home, yeah. I was at the worst possible as a human being, as a man, as a, you know, a potential father, just craziness. I was wow. thinking, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. God's always been there for me. So that's like a cornerstone of my life. However, that doesn't change the fact that I felt like absolute garbage. <laughs> yeah. But in that car ride home, there was yeah. something in my heart and mind that hardened and said, I'm not going to be able to count on anyone else. If Ooh. I'm going to make something of myself, it's going to be me. And I'm not going to be trusting in anyone else. It, you either have the grit and determination and that fire started then. Wow. And it's a beautiful one. It's not that I hated the world. I'm not on a revenge okay. tour with my life. I'm not yeah, yeah. out for anybody. Mm -hmm. I don't even think of that company anymore. That was my opportunity mm -hmm. to learn in the fire that steel is not going to melt unless it's really hot, right? Yeah. So that was kind of my story. Wow. And from then on, I was already not risk averse. And I just said, look, I'm going to bet on me. Yeah. And getting into real estate, 100% commission job was the most irresponsible thing I could possibly do <laughs> with a kid that's under one and yeah. a wife who teaches if I really want to do something in my life. Yeah. And she said, well, you just need to try because what if? And so I did. This is your wife? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, wow. okay, we'll try this. Best decision I've ever made every single year. Besides one year, I've made more than the next. I've been absolutely blessed. And it's more money than I can have ever thought of, more opportunities, more amazing people that I've met. And it all started with, do you have the determination and the grit to move forward in life? And are you going to say that you want to make $100,000 a year? Are, are you going to say that? Or are you just going to put in the work and do it? Because everybody says they oh, want to wow. make $100,000 a year, but no one is willing to work for it, even when they're put in situations to where they could easily do that. Yeah. And real estate's just like any other. I'm sure there's tons of other industries. It just got real heavy with no, you in my, dude, in my life story, but you're asking that question. That was the moment that is very difficult for me to go back to because that was the most soul defining moment of, I think, my life, my career. Yeah. Soul, dude, I, that's like a gift. I, I really appreciate it. This is the first time we met. And you gave me this gift to kind of share with me like, well, this is when my soul was crushed. So, and it became, made me who I was. Now, most people, um, are you, have you read Anti-Fragile or seen any of the, the communications no. about anti-fragility? Oh man, you would dig it. There's a lot of discussion about systems that can handle pressure. And then when the pressure is removed, it goes back to its original formation and they call that resilience. But there's new studies about material science that's called anti-fragile. And it means when you put pressure on a system, it doesn't go back, it gets stronger. And there's a great inspirational book out there. And I think it's called Anti-Fragile. And it's like, I get better because of this. Or post-traumatic growth syndrome. There's a whole new area of study called post-traumatic growth. But my question to you is, you gave me a sneak peek into your upbringing. <laughs> and I actually think we share this because I came from a blue collar family. I remember my dad came home and this memory is going to be butchered and I'm sure he'll buzz me and be like, it didn't happen that way. But my memory, my <laughs> myth is my dad came home with, um, we had this old box set TV and he came home with it with like, Hey, there's this new game thing called an Atari and he sells me on it. Look at the box and look at these games. And this is going to be really fun. I said, yeah, look, set it up for me. And he said, no, my sons aren't going to be blue collar workers, computers, and not gaming, but computers and technology are where I want my kids to be because that's white collar. you got a good future. So to play this game, he sells me on it, and I have to put it together. And I credit my dad and my mom on a creative side. Each, to, each in their own way have encouraged that, but we came from that. And we could talk about my own soul-crushing moments, but in those moments, I have found that when I've had an anti-fragile moment, it's because I feel like I have been at absolute bottom. 
Do you find that your upbringing positioned you to channel that moment into something better? Or where does I, that foundation come? I don't know if it like springboarded me to be in a better position. I think I was very aware that I was the first person to get a degree in my family. And I was very aware that when I started making wow. money, I was the first person to make money in my family. Yeah. I, I think I just come from a point of abundance and I want to take everybody wow. with me. And yeah, man, <laughs> you don't know the position you're in, right? Like when I was a kid, like I would, on my birthday, we got to go out to a restaurant and that was the time we got to go out to restaurants. Wow. So we would always go to Red Lobster. So even like today, <laughs> I still want to go to Club Lob and I want to get my biscuits. Yes. And, uh, For me, it's ice cream. Total so, abundance. So, right. But you didn't know that you, like, I didn't yeah. know I was poor. I just, I lived in a place called Bonneville in East Orlando. Like we had okay. wheels on my house. I didn't know we were poor, man. We were just happy. I guess yeah. that was what, it, that's what the neighborhood was. And then you move up and. It's only until later you find all that stuff out. My dad worked the same job in the same room, in the same position on the same machine for 37 years. It's unheard of. In the of same today. room, which again, goes back to your point, like how things have changed. You could get a job back in the eighties and there was a thing called a pension that doesn't happen yeah. anymore. Social you contracts know? gone. We, yeah, we know that. Right. And that's I, okay. You know, because yeah. it doesn't matter if you're born in the 1800s, the 2100s, like just adapt. Yeah. Find your peace and find out what you're good at and what you, what you like doing. And fortunately for me, I just feel like all of my past sales experiences led me to this place in real estate where I could literally just no holds barred talk to people. Yes. They totally understand that I'm only interested in helping them out. Yeah. It's a blessing to get to help them out. Is that how I get paid when you buy or sell a house? Yes. Everybody understands. Like we all get that yeah. social construct, but people desperately want somebody that's going to be on their side, that has experience, that can flash their teeth. And when they need to negotiate hardcore, I'm not the guy you want to mess with Yeah, because that's how I am. But I'm also going to be loving and I'm going to follow your lead and do what you're asking me to do. And I'm yeah. not interested in manipulating people or talking them into something and in fact, most of my sales is complete devil's advocate. I walk into your house. You want to sell your house? You call me up. You're like, Billy, I want to sell this house. I'm like, Grant, this is a beautiful house. Why in the world would you want to sell this? Yeah. <laughs> like, I call it unsales. So I have my own yeah. sales program I call unsales. And it's not reverse psychology. It really is. Let's get to the nitty gritty. Do you even really want to sell, in your case, sell this thing? In my case, yeah. I'm often talking to a potential buyer and I often push them away. Do you need it? Like with the website company, do you need a mm -hmm. new website? Really? Let's talk about. Yeah. Well, it helps to uncover, right? Instead of me asking a series of 25 questions, if I um, ask one question, then it can just start from wherever mm -hmm. you happen to be. Like when I train for open houses, mm -hmm. I grew my business. I sat in open houses 10 hours yeah. a weekend for two years. Me and my wife made that pact. And for wow. two years, I was going to burn the candle at both ends. And we were going to give it a real shot because you either go all in or something or you don't, don't have anything. That's not worth it. So I would just ask people here, take a look at the house. It's this, take, don't forget this one thing. Okay. They would come back and I would just say, Hey Grant. So what's your story, man? Mm, that's good. And it's such an open-ended good sales question because I'm just going to catch them to wherever their mind is. I didn't ask them something specific about the house. I didn't ask them a yes or no easy question. Yeah. I could just walk out. I just opened it up and they're whatever they're thinking. Like maybe they're just yeah. randomly thinking about their dog going to a vet or just something completely unrelated, but you need to learn to speak with people and you need to learn to go down those rabbit holes of conversation and yeah. you need to, what me and my broker call hanging in the pocket. Hanging need, in the pocket. Where does this come yeah. from? So it's just having a conversation. So for example, when I go into somebody's house and I'm going to help them through something, whether I was recommended to you or not, there still needs to be a face-to-face. -face. We got to know each other. Yeah. Like when I text, I use a lot of emojis now because I have to do my best to make sure that you understand how I'm trying to come across because we may not have a long history of life for you to know that I'm the driest, most sarcastic guy of all time. <laughs> and that's just my humor. And it comes yeah. off as rough around the edges, or it comes off as a little brazen. And you might think I'm a little jerkish when you first meet me, Sure, but it's, that's just my humor. And again, it goes back to, I don't care what people think of me, but I also need to be savvy enough in my workplace and the people that I'm around to make wow. sure that 
I can let them in and understand that I do care about them. So hanging in the pocket is just, I'm sitting there talking to you and I ask you a question about something and you just go off into something else. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. So, oh, you, you yeah. want to be close to your aunt? Well, what does she do? Where is she at? Okay. Well, what, what's important yeah. about that? Or tell me more about that or you yeah. know, just something completely unrelated, but it yeah. helps people bring their guard down. It helps them talk. It just gives you more time physically yeah. so that people can decompress and de-stress right. and they're not that's you know, right. they're not sitting like this. It's you're going to mirror and match them. You're going to let them calm down. However, they're sitting, you need to sit, make them feel comfortable. Because yeah. I'm in your house. You've invited me into your house. And that's right. I want to make sure that you understand that I want your business. And I'm going to ask you for your business. But it, you also need to understand that I'm treating you as if you're a real person because you're a yeah. real person. Father, dad, husband, whatever you are, like that's how I am. And that's why I love the brokerage I'm in because. My broker treats me like that. I'm Billy, the husband and dad of two. Sure. I'm not agent number such and such that yeah. does this much. And these are my numbers and these are my percentages. And this is how much money I make the company. No, it's Billy is an asset. First and foremost, he's a husband and he's a father. And then now we yeah. can talk about the work stuff. So we, uh, I'm also just in an incredibly blessed situation. And yeah. There's ways that I got here through crisis situations too. When I first moved to Lakeland, I synced up with a group of guys here that were making a ton of money in real estate in 2006, 2007. They had gone from seven, uh, zero to 8 million in real estate with lease options and no doc loans. And they were killing it. I think you're pretty familiar with what happened after that. But if, at that moment, they were riding high. And obviously we were all studying wealth. I was in my late twenties and I was like, I'm learning about wealth, son. So we were on a voracious amount of accountability, just reading. And so we got onto a real estate uh, sales lease option. We'd go find people that were saying rent to own. We'd mm -hmm. go get a, a lease on it. We'd wordsmith it to get an option on the house. And then as soon as we got that signature, we did an open house and we flipped it for that deposit check. And it was a high intense situation, but it really taught me a lot. But sometimes when you'd find someone who was potentially renting or selling their home, we learned this phrase of the posture of the room, learn the posture. And it, you're, what you're saying about being in the pocket or you're in someone else's home, the posture is how their se seating is mirroring them. But if it's a grandma's place, I'm not going to sit leaning forward at them with teeth bared. I'm going <laughs> to slouch a little bit like I was yeah. the grandkid and just right. finding the posture of a room fit in here or leave. Cause you're right. Salespeople forget this is someone's sacred space and making sure that you gel with that is the first rule that I unconsciously learned about mirroring just being in someone's living room. But that's when we were studying Zig Ziglar, right? Some of these old school character <laughs> counts people. Some tactics that I feel have been yeah. molded over time. And yeah. I, I hate to say tactics because I hate sales altogether, man. I'm the yeah. worst. If you try to sell me something, I'm critiquing you. I'm like, that's just such a terrible opening. Why, yeah. why would you ask me a hypothetical question that we all know the answer? <laughs> that's just, you're putting no effort. Oh what man, getting paid? Come on. So I, I promised this before we got on the call that I, I did sure. work for a boiler room and I'll just tell you the situation. I won't even tell you the stories. Mine was in IT recruiting. IT just recruiting. All headsets on. All of us were lined up. How many people in the room? Probably 10, 12. All Dude. of us just. Go. We, the company I went to work for, and I think they're still around, they negotiated back taxes. So we would get leads oh, of people that no. owed millions. And the deposit was 1200 bucks. These people were tax avoiders, tax evaders, and some of them had criminal backgrounds. And talk about avoiding the phone. We had private investigators on staff looking for just phone numbers. And I'm telling you, you had to learn. It was sink or swim. I, I ran the night sales floor, bro, 40 openers. And we had seven closers. And it was, it was a complete fist fight, if you will, of we've got to make this number tonight or I'm fired tonight. But the money was absolutely stupid. But, I, but we learned and we had a technique. And this is partly where I got my unsales technique. We had to learn how to keep someone on the phone in less than two questions without freaking them out and using shame, hook, like hooking them. And, right. it, and this person is tax evading. And so it's like, oh my God, it was, it was the most stressful thing I've ever been in. But I will say I learned a ton about sales in that environment. Hey, what I don't want to do. And like I bet you learned a lot about yourself too. Oh my. And what I wasn't willing to do 
Yeah. One of my closers, I won't say his name on the air, he would close for one week a month. And he was our highest closer. He asked for his bonus to be given to him in cash, which was often 30 to 50 grand a month. And he would get an actual briefcase of cash and disappear for two or three weeks. He would disappear to Costa Rica and blow it all on what you can imagine. Ultimately, you do you, man. You, you do, do you, man. You. Ultimately, blew it on, uh, didn't blow the wicked it. Wicked or successful just as much as everybody else is, man. It is and so you learn is. what you want and you learn what you don't want. Yeah. And I knew I didn't want that life at all. And they actually hired us. I'll tell you this, but this speaks to integrity. People of integrity, we wouldn't yeah. cross that line and we had a reputation. That's why they made us managers over the night shift and the day shift, me and my sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah. integrity, because they hired us because they said, listen, our openers and closers will, will by hook and crook make the sale, but we need someone of integrity over these people. And that's yeah. why they hired us. And that taught me a lesson. Like there's something to this old school stuff character integrity honesty and that really started shaping my worldview back then man that's yeah. huge i i jumped on this because i thought you were an investor are you a real estate investor you yeah. have some of your own investments yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah. it's so all real estate so that opened the way it's all in real estate and it's getting into crypto now but okay yeah it was by opportunity and i talk a lot about this to people it's not like it's the same way in real estate. You're not going to wake up and be like, oh, today's the day I want to sell my house. It's a process, right? And there's opportunities and things that happen along the way. So I have parents that live a block from me now. They're oh. retired. They wanted to move, right? Well, I said, well, how about I give you a house and you could just stay there part of the time, but come back here and help with the kids because I really yeah. need to help with the kids, right? <laughs> yeah. So we went up to North Carolina and a little place where I used to live outside Banner Elk, which is beautiful. So we were like, hey, we're going to go spend $200,000. We can afford this. We're going to find a little house. And then my parents can just live up there whenever they want and then come back, just back and forth. So wow. we go up. My wife walked into a $500,000 house, gave me the look that she's only given me twice. And we own both of those houses. And so <laughs> we got that house. But worst case scenario, always make sure you can financially afford stuff. The same sure. thing in this crypto stuff, man. People are don't play with money that you can't afford to lose. It's mm -hmm. not a little... No bullet point like mm -hmm. oh we have to say this no if you are financially savvy you yes. will follow that yeah. so we could afford it and i talked to this management company and they said well we're one of two management companies up here we have a house in the neighborhood we ran oh, out wow. i'd like to can i take a look at it give you some conservative estimates if you were to short-term rent it i was like okay so they came back and they're like well you know we think just conservatively speaking like maybe like thirty-five thousand dollars a year i was like i'm sorry what and I said, if you can pay for half of my mortgages, I'm completely okay with that. And then my parents can stay there whenever they want. I was like, all right, I'll give this a shot. So that turned into our most profitable when real estate investment that? right now. I was in the middle of 2020, October 2020. Oh, you caught it right, brother. So we did that. And then it's funny how when you buy your first and you see it and you get over the jitters and the scaredy yes. cat moments of signing for a mortgage, it goes doop, 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 doop. So the next domino was... We had always talked about this place that we went to Cocoa Beach and we went with our friends. They owned this unit since 2009 by happenstance. He backed into the whole Airbnb thing before it was even a thing. He learned out how to do that. So he's like the uh, super host. So we we're like, man, I'd love to own one of these things, but they never come up. So one comes up and we're like, this is after October, this is like February. Like we had just shelled out in, in 20 in 2021. 2021. Yeah. Wow. So I get under contract and I'm like, oh my gosh. I, Is it just a really condo? Are, are we really? Yeah. Just it's an oceanfront condo and it's beautiful. And we gutted it and went through the whole hassle of learning the hard way of how not to choose a contractor. And that's just been the, the nightmare of my life. But we buy that and then yeah. we have two. And then like my parents lived in a townhouse. So I was like, I want to move you into a house close to me and I'll just yeah. buy that one. So it, it's interesting. So we have three rental properties now. That's great. You know, I have my house, my parents' house, my mother-in-law's house. So yeah. we do that. Yeah. And then the returns are good. It also helps that I'm in real estate. So we have that now. And I'm learning how to consult other people. On Saturday, I'm going to see an off-market condo. What good I do is you. I talk. Like I a talk, pocket listing? No, not necessarily mine. Sure. But what I do is 
go regionally, find the management companies. For example, there's one in Key West I want to talk to. There's one in West Coast, Captiva, Sanibel. Yeah. And then there's one in Cocoa. It's called Stay in Cocoa Beach. And there's a guy named Dean. You can look this up. He, he runs it. I think I've seen this one, by the way. Family owned for 20 years, right? So I said, hey, Dean, I love you guys. You guys seem to be the biggest. Talk to me about your company. Everything checks out. They have offsite laundry. That means something to you if you have short-term rentals. And that yes. would mean nothing if you don't. But <laughs> so... What, what I said was, hey, if you ever hear about these things before they hit the market, could you let me know? You yeah. need to get on these people's lists. So there's That's one right. that came up. It's 525. Don't worry about what the cost is. Worry no. about what the numbers are. So no. it's not even with Dean's management company. It's with another management company, but just he has ears on the ground. And they're a little wary because I'm a real estate guy. So they're thinking I'm just trying to get a listing. I'm like, no, dude, I invest. I do, yeah. I'm not interested in that. Just give me the property, show me the numbers. Yeah. And so that's one thing that I've really leaned into because just, that's just huge. knowing how to find properties that are already under management, you don't have to buy furnishings. You don't have to worry yes. about getting it ready. You don't have to consult with a company. Stay in Cocoa Beach has a unit in the same complex. They only run eight complexes in all of Cocoa Beach. This is one of them. They have oh, units wow. there already. They can show you what the ROI is going to be. They can show you the numbers. As an example of opportunities, the building block of that is the skill you learn in sales. And that is how do I build authentic connection with everyone? Yeah. And if I can know how to build authentic connection when I am trying to sell somebody, what I realize it's actually not, a, sales is the fruit of good relationships. Yeah. And, and, and because we exchange values, we end up exchanging value. <laughs> and so yeah. then you're out there going, no, I'm good. 525, dude, you and I both know, cause I have the a number. List. I don't care about the number. Like the numbers, the It'll number work. is relevant to people who That's don't right. have a wealth mindset. That's right. That's right. The number is irrelevant. If you mm -hmm. know what you're doing and you just need to make the numbers work. Like That's right. I got under contract to 415. The thing appraised at 401. Why did I come out of pocket another $14,000 on top of having to put 25% down and pay closing costs? Like, why would yeah. I do that? Because I'm not interested in the right year and now. Nope. I'm interested in worth. 10 yeah. years from now, what kind of position is are me and my family going to be in? Yeah. You know, you mentioned wealth. I just did a panel yesterday for crypto. We touched on NFTs and we had several high level people here that work for crypto names you might recognize. One of the guys works for the original Crypto Kitty company. They were trying to get their head around NFTs. And I said this, correlating to your statement about wealth. They said, I don't understand if I'm buying a, this JPEG, what's the value to me? And I said, listen, if you meet a true wealth person, and I've been mentored by several, I have many moons to go before I achieve what I consider wealthy. Me too. Me but, too. Me but too. I'm not. I've had great mentors. And this one guy, he would always tell me, you don't understand wealth. And when they mentioned this about NFTs, I, I challenge him. When you're around really wealthy people and they buy, say, for example, an Andy Warhol painting, do they suddenly hang that up in their bedroom? No, chances are they have other art. Do they suddenly hang it in their living room? No, chances are they have other art there too. What happens to it? And all the NFT people in the room and the financial managers in the room said, put it in a warehouse because they understand the value of the asset. They don't even necessarily care about the cost or the actual asset itself yeah. unless they're a true enthusiast. They understand the value of this thing and it could be in storage for all they care. They, right. know, that they, they know the future value of something. I would love and, 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 and so I think it demystified. This isn't just tech. This is future value. I know I get it. I think the NFT is harder to wrap your head around than sure. Um, crypto is easier to understand if you've ever seen Ninja talk about V-Bucks and buying skins. That's all it is. It's <laughs> what is V-Bucks? Well, it's just this made up like currency in this in this video game. That that's it. Dude, we've been doing this forever. We've been doing this forever. It's and, just, and just different. I don't know why people think it's any different. It's, it's just, it's a, as right now, I think just superficially, it's a, the crypto has a, has a marketing problem. Like that we're using weird terms for stuff. But I love it because I do. we're still on the front went front end. Totally. And if we get in now, 10 years from now, it's going to be adopted in such mainstream, but like even dude, Starbucks has already come out saying that yes. they're going to accept crypto and stuff. So they're working on that. When everybody hears Elon Musk, cause he's the only guy in that space that anybody recognizes, yep. Yep. like why would these Fortune 500 yeah, companies be buying billions of dollars in Bitcoin? Dude. Let's think about that. They see something you know? that I don't see. You know, the way I look at it for people trying to build wealth, and I'm not the person to listen to. I'm in a good spot, but yeah. there's if you can make 
If you can make 250, you can make 500. If you make 500, you can make a million. If you can make a million, somebody's making 5 million. How do we get there? Real estate is my focus. Yes. That's what makes me money. That's the engine of the car that I'm building. I Grow can't, what you know. I can't take away my focus from real estate because that's the engine, but the engine is going to help give me money to invest and eventually build the car, but I'll always have that engine. So I feel like people take their eyes off of what's working. Crypto can be amazing, or this can be amazing, but don't take your focus off of this. This is what's yes. making you money now. Yeah. So I think people are too shiny object type of people out there. I'm seven years in, and now I'm starting to see the fruits of all my labor and just people aren't willing to spend the time. And that's a millennial type of generational, we can press a button and get anything in two seconds type of problem. But <laughs> that's a whole nother conversation yeah. it says the young pup you're a young pup you might be a millennial bro <laughs> <laughs> i'm the oldest millennial 84 okay I'm i think that's literally the oldest I'm 79. Yeah. well let's give you some time back but real quick for anyone that might stumble upon the show what's one book you recommend and one concept you would give anyone who's doing wealth building a book i mean is it cliche to say rich dad poor dad no is that cliche well, it's i mean just, it you, might be but it, it might be cliche I, I, for a reason I, I think the one thing that I would want anybody listening to you or me, just you need to clearly understand in life that it is okay to not look to your parents for financial guidance. Yes. You need to understand yes. lovingly, but with a clear head that I am not going to my parents for financial advice because they cannot give it to me. My parents mm. did not make the type of money I'm in. They are not in my situation. Yep. It is not that I don't love them. It is that you need to appropriately seek advice from people that are in your similar situations or in situations that you want to be in. Yes, that's good. That's really good. That so I got my I got both questions answered. A book you recommend, Rich Dad Poor Dad, absolutely, and then this advice. It's okay to not go to your parents, which is reinforced in Rich Dad Poor Dad. In a that's, huge that, way. that was my point. That's yeah. that's why I say that book yeah. because because you, you just really need to understand like we're taught by our parents and I have a psychology degree and that'll seep out sometimes. But sure. by the time you're five, you're already basically created as a person and yeah. everything that you know and understand about the world are primarily going to be from your parents until you're 18, 20, 21 ish. Because yeah. then you'll have your own thoughts and opinions on things, or at least get to a point where you feel secure enough to do that, depending on what kind of culture and household that you live in. But yeah, you just need to be okay understanding okay, my parents aren't the situation I want to be in and yeah. I love them. And it says nothing about your respect or disrespect for them. Yeah. But you need to seek advice and mentorship from other people that yeah. are in the spaces and doing the things that you want to do. That's huge. Because they cannot help you. Yeah. And I would say that even, and especially parents, because we're hung up on our parents, which sometimes from a psychology perspective, I call the first gods. They're the first people we worship and want the best for, but they're also sometimes the first people to let us down. It's not about that. It's about the principle for me is go to the person who knows. And that's simply it. If someone does know about the financial yeah. situation and the distance you want, go to that person has yeah. nothing to do about your current peers. Yeah. I really appreciate you making the time this afternoon and getting to know you a bit more. Thank, Thank you, you so much, man. Have a appreciate great it. afternoon, dude.